the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. Hey everybody, welcome back to the IGC. I'm your host, Jason Abbott. Thanks again for subscribing, sharing, discussing, uh, shooting stuff out on Facebook and Twitter. I really appreciate the support. If you want to support us in other ways, you can hit us up at www.intellectualgentlemensclub.com backslash support. Our affiliate sponsors are in there. We have a direct PayPal donate button, and we have our first actual sponsor, our pal Silk over at Renault Video Productions. You can check out their site at renovp.com. They're professional videographers uh, specializing in cinematic weddings, nature videos, extreme conditions, whatever you need. Give those guys a ring over there. You can find us on Facebook if you search Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. You can find us on Twitter at IGCCast. We're on Google+. Plus with the YouTube channel. You're probably listening on iTunes or Stitcher. Kind of all over the place. You're going to be on a journey with me today, talking with a couple individuals from Naked and Afraid. One of them is a return guest, Forrest Galante. He was on with uh, E.J. Snyder back something like episode 29. Forrest is a biologist specializing in herpetology. Uh, right now he lives in Southern California, but grew up in Zimbabwe. He is an avid spear fisherman, a rugby player, a backpacker, the creator of TravelGrub.com, where... Travelers can get interesting reviews on local cuisine in exotic places. Uh, check that out at TravelGrub.com. The person who joins him today in the guest chair is Manu Toigo. She grew up in North Queensland, Australia. Uh, she's living in Southern California currently. Uh, she was on the episode with Forrest Galante. She talks about uh, her experience with dengue fever which uh, nearly took her life um, a little bit here in the interview coming up. In Australia, she grew up on a farm, and she had to adapt and improvise to uh, some environments that were harsher than uh, at least I had experienced when I was a child. After that, she joined the military, did some special operations training, some survival experience. Uh, currently, she works on the ARC experience with 6th uh, and 7th graders, taking kids up into the mountains and showing them a little bit of adventure. So I think it's really cool she's doing something like that. So stay tuned. You're going to listen to them for the next hour or so. After that, we will have a little Wisdom of the Elders with some some little ramblings from uh, Robert Anton Wilson. And I think Blackmail will take us out with the track. To give you guys an idea of what we're talking about, here's a audio trailer of Naked and Afraid. Four hungry, thirsty, strangers, completely naked, a recipe for disaster. Four survival experts. Four is over. Yeah. A little weird out. Took on the toughest challenge of their lives. Bitch! I can't handle it. Our last minute shelter is not holding out particularly well. Thanks. Two bears dropped in the harshest environment in different locations with no water, no food, and... No clothes. Oh. He just clawed me in the, the package. Where two people could easily fail. Ready to pull my hair out. Can four strangers find a way to survive and thrive together? Hey, this is not a holiday. This is survival. Oh, ah. In the beauty. Ah. And danger of the jungles of Panama. They faced physical and mental traumas. It was an extreme fight with nature and sometimes each other. I have not been handed anything. I can't wait to be out of this jungle. And for one, an unforeseen danger that put her on the brink of death. My new contracted dengue fever. Oh. And you can eventually die from that. Welcome back to the IGC, ladies and gentlemen. We have another fantastic episode ahead here. Um, I would like to welcome back to the show, Forrest Galante. Thank you. Appreciate you being back, Forrest. Uh, we're Appreciate gonna... you having me. Yeah, absolutely. 
Anytime. We're going to be discussing a little bit of Naked and Afraid again. Um, if you've heard the IGC in the past, we had EJ Snyder on first, and then we had EJ come back with Forrest, and now we have Forrest back with uh, Manu Toigo. And uh, they were together on an episode, I believe it was in Panama, right? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So, Manu, welcome to the show. I just wanted to uh, say thank you very much for being on, and uh, I hope we uh, have an interesting conversation here. It never, uh, never fails to disappoint. <laughs> thank you for having me, Jason. All right. So, just to kind of give everybody a basic background of Naked and Afraid, if, uh, if someone's tuning in and they haven't tuned into the show, uh, Forrest, can you give us a backdrop of what basically Naked and Afraid is? Sure, yeah. Well, I'll start off by saying, just to prepare for this, I'm sitting here butt naked in the woods. No, I'm just kidding. Nice. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> Naked and Afraid is the Everest of Survival Challenges. What it is, it's a show on the Discovery Channel, and what they do is they take two participants, or in our case, four, but we'll get to that, and they drop you off middle of the jungle, butt naked, with one item of your choosing. Any one item, you know, within reason. Nobody's taking a Ford Raptor out there. But um, any one item within reason, and you have to survive for 21 days completely uh, on your own wits and skills, and then make it to an extraction point that is quite some distance from where you are inserted. And, of wow. course, this is all filmed and put on Discovery. Sure. It's, they call it a uh, reality show, but... It's it's more of a uh, I don't really consider it a reality show. I I have a bad taste with, in my mouth when people say reality TV. I always see yeah, like a producer I, behind the I scenes. I mean, I would agree with you. And this was right. more like a docudrama. Um, yep. They don't largely, from what I understand, they kind of leave you guys alone to do what you do, and it's low impact from production. Is that right, Manu? Yeah, it pretty much is. It's a very skeleton crew. Um, making sure they just cover the basics. You're only typically followed around by one camera guy, a sound guy, and perhaps two other people. And nearby, somewhere around us, we know or are aware of that there's a medic available um, only in um, extreme situations, like an emergency or something like that. Got you. And as far as the additional audio and video from... My previous conversations with Forrest, he kind of explained to me as we were messaging back and forth of what those necklaces are on the show, and, and that's actually a microphone that they, they provide you guys with, right? Yeah, that's it's correct. pretty clever. Right. Yeah. And then they also give each of you a handy cam, right? That's right. Yes. Cool. So with all of those, they kind of get a, a really good product. I, I've really enjoyed the show. I haven't seen every episode. I've got a ton stored up in my DVR, uh, but I, I thought your guys' is episode was really interesting because it gave a much different dynamic um well you know jason you're funny you say that because you're not the only one who thought that um yeah i've watched just about every episode now because obviously once you're on the show you feel committed to it sure and um the episodes are up and down i'd say some of them are really exciting some of them tend to be a little bit bland and boring and uh i say it's funny you say that because um to date uh, i had this conversation quite recently with somebody from production our episode is still the highest rated episode very cool it is so you guys were on the island in two separate teams you didn't know that you were there together and then all of a sudden, it seems like you guys met at a waterfall and like, holy shit, there's other people here. You got it. <laughs> yeah. So it seems forced. It seems like you kind of got the shit end of the deal as far as partner. But it seems like there was much redemption. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last time. But it seems like when you met up with uh, Manu and Russell, things got a little bit better for you. What were the dynamics like when you guys met up in the, uh, in the middle of nowhere? I was actually uh, very... How would you say? I want to say excited, but I knew that it was going to make things better. At least that's what I thought at first. Mm -hmm. Because when you have more people, then there's less work to be shared around. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, our circumstances. Be gentle. Be gentle. <laughs> I, I, I know. I know. And and you know, it's. It is what it is. Right. Cassie, Cassie faced, uh, the things that she did. And I think from just that experience and she saw how we worked and she saw what we could do and how we progressed. I hope and I believe 
that she has learned a great deal about it and maybe not step into something so extreme. You know, it's so funny, Jason and Manu, to hear, you know, it just reinforces everything I think about Manu, hearing how she felt about when we came together. I mean, she's so caring, loving, and open. If you watch our episode, you'll see there's a scene where where we first all kind of make eye contact. We're up on a waterfall, Manu and her partner, Russell, are down below. And you see, you know, just this woman who's so open and caring. She spreads her arms with this giant smile on her face. Now, I am the complete opposite. (laughs) And I say that. Not because I was concerned. I I had such a sort of flurry of ideas and emotions when I saw these other two. I came over the waterfall. I looked down. There's two more people. First of all, I thought, oh, shit. Now I've got three people to take care of instead of one. Mm -hmm. And the reason I thought that was probably because um, of the partner I'd had up until that point. And then I went, then I flip flopped and went back to, oh, well, this could be really good. Maybe they're better than me. Maybe they're better than my partner. And then I went back to the, oh shit again, this could be terrible. So I was bouncing back and forth with this, uh, mental struggle slash emotional battle about, you know, how the dynamic was going to be. Fortunately, my, you know, my middle assessment of, you know, these guys could make things a lot easier was incredibly accurate. That's good. Now it's a 21 day challenge. And what day was it when you guys met up at, when your two teams met? Uh, it was it 10 or 11? Okay. So you had, <laughs> you had been s- on your way for quite a while. That's I think right. It was day, I think it was day 10. Yeah. Day 10. 10 or 11. Yeah. That sounds because, right. That sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah. Because Russell and I, uh, where we were in the swamps of the jungle, all we wanted to do was get out of there because it was not good conditions at all. Um, so we, they would not allow us to trek out early because we wanted to leave camp um, and try and make it to the waterfall and see what we were going to face there. It could have been better. In my mind, it could have been a better option for us. Um, but they made us stay until day eight, and then they actually allowed us to leave a day early. So I think it was day 10, uh, Forrest, because sure. we, were una- we were unaware they were going to connect us both. So it was a big surprise. I sure. actually thought you guys were natives. I was like, oh. <laughs> That's funny. And well, like- I'm sure we looked at it, looked at, looked the part at that time, but <laughs> once again, just shows the contrast in our groups because I, I had, felt that I'd finally established a very comfortable style of life uh, in our first 10 days with Cassie. I mean, not that her and I got along, but finally figured out the food sources and the water sources, et cetera. And then it was time to start making the trek. And, uh, you know, we were the opposite. I was like, well, I don't want to leave on day 10. I want to leave on day 21. So right. um, <laughs> just showing yeah. the contrast in the two couples in our locations. Yeah, Russell and I were having, um, we were doing very well. It's just that our resources were so limited. And uh, unlike you, you were on the beach, you had trees, you had more coconuts and things like that. We were, we had nothing. Right. And and so that's why we were trying to get the hell out of there. And it's not pleasant being in the swamps. That's for sure. It's interesting to see the different levels of desperation on the show. Um, you mentioned there's, you know, there's all different types of terrain and different types of individuals that bring different materials with them, like their one item. But in mm-hmm. some areas, you'll have a very dry climate where it's, it's inducive to fire and you don't get wet, probably a little bit warm. Um, and others I've seen, it's like, you know, 40, 50 degrees, constantly wet, can't keep yep. a fire going. Um, mm-hmm. you know, limited resources as far as food and water, clean drinking water, that is. Um, so, I mean, I can't help but kind of notice what it, when you when you uh, let me take this back a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking of like basically a resource based economy type of environment where um, you have your surroundings that keep you uh, that keep you fed, that keep you clothed. Not in your case, but you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, keep you nourished. But it seems like there when Losing my train of thought here, but it seems like when there are less resources, shit gets real a lot quicker. It seems like there would be, I mean, in your cases, there's only two, you know, to four people in your, in your episode, but it seems like there would be a lot of, uh, a lot more issues, especially if you integrated more people into that type of environment. It seems like there would be a, 
a huge breakdown compared to, you know, if you're on a beach, you got a lot of coconuts, you can dive for sure. food, you know, you can have shelter, things like that. So how do you think, well, um, you know, when you look at it like a global type of scale and you see different uh, different type of communities and cultures dealing with situations like that with desperate measures, what, hmm. what can you guys say about uh, how people react and what maybe some people could learn from the show from a hardship point of view? Well, I, th I think that, you know, to answer your question, uh, population is derived by available resources in, you know, throughout the globe. And, of course, that's not the case anymore because we can import export resources as needed. But, you know, looking back to historical man, you can see, you know, where large populations were established was a balance between available resources and, you know, the need to to build and develop and uh, evolve, if you will. Um, and I think something that you see in the show time and time again, of course, you know, I don't want you to take this as saying that anybody can do anything, but um, although available resources definitely help the individuals, at the end of the day, the people that are the most successful on the show and the reason I feel Manu and myself and a handful of others could thrive in any environment that I've seen on that show is because they're able to find resources where others are not. You know, if you know where to look, there's always some kind of a resource, whether that be the desert or the jungle or the beach, whether it be blazing hot or freezing cold. It's a matter of education and the ability to adapt that makes you a good survivor and, you know, generally drive us as humans. And I think when you see some of these couples and groups that fail, it's because they're not able to identify the usable resources in their habitats. That is true. I completely agree with that. And I also believe, too, that you have to have a form of creativity, being able to um, make adaptable, have your ideas adapt to your surroundings. Um, if you learn survival in the forest, and this is this is what a lot of schools are from my understanding and perhaps a little bit of experience here you know a lot of the schools are teaching you survival in one particular area so people who do these schools are only have the idea that that's the only terrain that they can survive in a good survivalist needs to be able to understand every single surrounding and um, an area of all possibilities. And I think that's where creativity comes into it because you have to be able to adapt to every single environment in order to survive. That's actually a really good point. And, and, and on the show, it's very clear that you have people that come in, they're like, I am a, I've been trained, and, and you know, they run down this excellent resume, and you think, well, this guy is going to be, you know, no problem. I'll get through this challenge, no problem. But they, what they do is they put somebody, it seems like, who's experiencing maybe in a desert scenario, they'll put them in, you know, a wet jungle environment just for that purpose, it seems like. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And, and a yeah. couple of episodes I noticed and the, the partners were, were basically, uh, confronting each other like, well, why are you on this show? You have no survival experience. You don't know what you're doing. And they're like, well, I just don't have any experience in the, in the wetness of a, of a swamp. What am I supposed to do here? You make a great point. Right. It's like you have to get creative. You have to be inventive. And Forrest, I know last time you were on the show, we talked about how you grew up in Zimbabwe or basically a bush boy. And, yep. um, you know, I think that was probably very helpful for you. Manu, what was, what was your upbringing like? Uh, were you a wilderness child, a, were you a <laughs> product of the environment around you? What was your experience like growing up? You grew up in Australia, right? Yeah, that's right. And I actually liked what you said. I'm a product of my environment. <laughs> so, um, aren't we all? <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, I grew up in uh, a very rural area, farming area, but also, you know, we have a lot of tr uh, jungles around in, in the areas that I'm in, particularly on the islands. So I remember trekking up through the islands, going through the jungle, the rainforests. Um, and of course, just the rural area, but I also have spent a lot of time out in the desert as well, you know, just, just growing up as a kid. So all these things I was already familiar with. And I guess growing out in the middle of nowhere, you have to, 
you have to be able to use your common sense. You just develop this common sense. Same with Forrest. You know, he grew up growing up with common sense, making sense of your environment and how to survive in it and keep yourself safe. Yep. And I think one of the things that you don't see regularly, you know, Manu and myself both being uh, internationals, um, you know, we, we survival for myself, and I'm sure I speak for Manu as well as being a farm child because I was also a farm child. It's not a, a field of study or a hobby for us as it is for so many comfortable right. Westerners. For us, it's a way of life, you know, to I agree. get by. And, you know, for, for Westerners, for America, and not all Westerners, of course, but, you know, the general people that you see doing naked and afraid, there are people from, you know, an affluent background or, you know, a nice suburban area in the United States. And survival for them is an after-school hobby or something right. they do on the weekends. It's not, it's not day-to-day -day life. And that, that, that makes a big difference in your survivability and your adaptability and your creativity out there. Because when you're immersed in a 24-7 as a child, you learn things that, you know, no, no weekend warrior could. I agree. Practice I makes agree. perfect, right? That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, and being comfortable, you know, being uh, comfortable in your surroundings. It's uh, you know, people go camping. I'm just going to use this as an example. People go camping, and they'll set up a nice cozy tent, thinking once that zipper is closed, they're safe. Right. <laughs> but they dare not sleep out in the open. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, not everyone does that, of course. I'm just using that as an example of, course, of yeah. how people you know, want to remain in this safe zone or thinking that they're in a safe zone. Well, it's incredible. When when I talk to people how I like to camp, they're like, well, where do you go? You know, I have some property up north in Michigan. And, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a uh, rustic camp area. You know, it's 10 acres up there. There's no shelter. There's no electricity. There's no running water. There's a river close by. It's a great place to just go and be in nature for me been there since I was a young boy. I hopefully will pass it along to my children someday and so on and so forth. But when pe when I talk to people about my camping, they're like, well, what size is your trailer? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, you're not, no, you don't understand. They're like, I like to camp. They're like, I like to winter camp, this and that. Well, well, how do you say so warm? It's like, well, you know, you can camp out in the open if you are, you know, if you think about what you're going to do. You know, you just have to be, kind of be prepared for things. But yeah. You know, in a situation like you're going into the wilderness and you have no clothes, you have no shelter, you have one tool, it's a much different situation. Like, I I look at the show and I'm not one of the people who say, like, yeah, I could do that, no problem, I'm naked and afraid. Yeah, I've been, I've, I'm an adventurer, I love the outdoors, I've been camping all my life, but I don't have the first survival skill to be able to, you know, make a hand drill and create a fire or sure. you know if i had a magnifying glass sure i could probably make that happen in a nice dry climate environment but, right you know i haven't had that type of training i haven't been in the military i haven't done any you know after school specials with survival training or anything like that i'm just you know like you like you're saying a weekend warrior i wish sure. i could take you know when when it, when man versus wild first came out in survivor man that's more the adventure like i think i could probably handle if i go in with right. a pack you know, I could last a week or two, walk my way out. You know, that would be more of a fun type of adventure. When you called it the Everest of survival challenges, that's a perfect way to put it, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I, I would agree, yeah. It, it, it does expose, um, expose us to the extremes. Extreme elements, extreme starvation, extreme dehydration. Um, hey. you really, you really get to know. You know how it feels to to just be completely exhausted and deprived of everything. Speaking of exhausted and deprived of everything, uh, you guys didn't get through completely unscathed. Manu, you had a uh, quite a scare after the the challenge was done. You did make it out with everybody, but yeah. you uh, you got very sick after that, didn't you? I did, and uh, all it takes is one mosquito bite. At what point during the challenge I was bit um, but they have an incubation uh, the virus has an incubation up to about 10 days what virus did you have exactly a uh, hemorrhagic dengue fever and in fact it's it's one of the world's biggest killers apart from Ebola of course 
Um, and there's no cure for that either, right? It's not like you can get a shot and you're good to go. No, no, there is no vaccinations for dengue and there is no cure, basically. Uh, mainly with the hemorrhagic. I'm not saying the other strains of dengue is any less, um, you know, deadly, but the hemorrhagic, of course, that involves your entire body internally hemorrhaging. It destroys every vessel in your body and every nerve in your body. Um, and it was scary. Uh, I almost, it's hard to believe that <laughs> this, this time, actually, this time last year, I was on my deathbed. That's this time trying. last year. Isn't that amazing, Forrest? This time it is. I, I recall it. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's no exaggeration. I mean, the show's not a joke. There's no water bottles and, you know, mozzie nets behind the scenes. It's, um, no. It's, Manu was legitimately on her deathbed and there was concern of loss for her. And that's for, you know, ba basically nothing in reward, but the, you know, the, of the attempt at completing something that you can be proud of for the rest of your life. And, you know, Manu excelled at it while in the field, and it was just very unfortunate that she contracted that disease. So how long did that whole, that whole, how did that, that ordeal, how long did that all take? When did you, when were you cleared to go home, and how, how's mm. your recovery been since then? Is it something She's still recovering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. <laughs> um. You know, it's it's still very real to me. I mean, I spent all of October in the hospital, and then November was just basically, I was basically paralyzed in my own home, unable to do anything on my own. I couldn't even go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't stand. I couldn't do anything. And then I started physical therapy in December, about mid-December or j just after the show aired. And I had my last physical therapy appointment in September, early September. So this is the reality of it. It, it. You know, I was having physical therapy two, three times a week for um, at least eight months solid. And then the last few months, it was just one one time a week. Let me ask you this. With, with all the ailments and things that people have contracted from the show, I'm sure there's massive waivers you have to sign your life away basically to get on the show and to do all that. I have a, I guess a two part question. A is, um, is there any payment or reward for completing the challenge to be able to take that time off of work and, and step away from the home life? And second part question is, are medical bills like that covered by the show? Or is that something you'd have to pay out of pocket for? Well, there is a there is a stipend for your time out there, but it's uh, it's incredibly nominal. It's not something you know. People think that the five minutes on TV and you can retire. I mean, it's not the case for no. for a large number of people. They would make more money staying at home working than they would going out into the field for those twenty one days. Right. Um, so true. you certainly don't do it for the financial compensation, or at least I didn't, and I'm sh I know Manu didn't either. Um, and then I will let Manu refer to the medical things as she has the expertise in that. <laughs> well, um, what I will say is uh, the insurance that we are covered under only covers you from the day you fly out to the day you fly in. Okay. Um, I got sick after, you know what I mean, the, the symptoms and the severity of it. So you were already home then? I was already home. Oh shit. I don't know. Well, that. to, to, before that continues, I will say that Manu and I flew home together, yes. um, which was lovely. And I, I can't say I knew there was anything wrong with her, but it was obvious that she hadn't recovered from our stint. I mean, she was loopy in the airport, incredibly low energy, and just nothing like she usually is or had been for the prior 21 days. So, how so long, I, at the, how, pardon me. I'm sorry. How long? After the challenge was complete to your flight home. Uh, about 48 <laughs> hours. Oh shit. So they're like, ah, oh, you're in and out of here. Let's go. Right? Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty much. So did they rehydrate you guys properly? Did they give you some IVs? What kind of food did you get? And just, like, just regular food and water. water. Nothing, nothing outrageous, but, um, yeah, I mean, nothing outrageous, but yeah, no, it was very obvious that Manu was not back to herself when we were getting on the plane and then it took yeah. some days until she really realized the severity of her ailment. 
Yeah, because remember, Forrest, I was just like, I don't feel well. I, I, I had already started getting the headaches. I was already feeling lethargic and, and uh, low energy. Um, remember at the airport, I'm trying to find some medication for a headache. Yep. Yep. But it, by the time I got home, it, it, I just knew something was really wrong, but I couldn't. And because I've had experiences before, you know, doing uh, survival, um, I just knew that there wasn't something that's like, nah, I'm usually bounced back. This is not normally how I would be affected. So I knew there was something wrong. So, yeah, we got in on the Friday wee hours of, what, Saturday morning? Something and, like that, yeah. Yeah, and I was in the emergency <laughs> room Tuesday morning. Okay, and did, did they pretty much know what you had right away? You let them know, no. hey, I'm coming back from Panama. You know, it's, did, they, um, did they know what to check for? No, no, not at all. Yeah. Uh, the fact that, I, you know, when I told him, I says, I just finished this jungle survival in Panama. They're just looking at me going like, <laughs> okay. And of course, you know, the state, my whole body was still, uh, um, had symptoms and signs of that kind of survival going on, particularly my feet. <laughs> but, oh, uh, right. Yeah, lack of footwear. Yeah. And then, um, but all they did was give me pain medication and fluids because they're just thinking, all right, survival, she's dehydrated, she's malnutritioned, uh, you know, she's anemic. So they sent me home just with that. But the very next day, it was the reality that something was severely wrong and they still did not know. And, and in fact, it was my, um, my husband, William, uh, that actually said, to the doctors, I think she's got dengue. She's got dengue. But they had no dengue testing kits at the hospital, and the CDC was shut down from the government shutdown. So the test couldn't <laughs> be sent off to, to um, you know, to check if it was a positive match. Instead, here I am getting spinal taps, MRIs, you name it, <sighs> for everything else. And, and Go ahead. Sorry, money. No, go ahead, boss. I was going to say, keep. I don't want to get too off topic here, but keep in mind, Jason, this is in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. This isn't, you know, some podunk little hospital. Of course. Um, and, you know, I have some experience in this because I contracted uh, a bad parasite in the Amazon uh, in about 2008. And um, w it's amazing how little familiarity American doctors have with parasites, tropical parasites, and understandably so. It's not like they're exposed to seeing, right. you know, patients with that on a weekly basis. Right. But, Americans live um, in a sterile world primarily. Hey, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, ab absolutely and completely. And, you know, Manu comes back with dengue and I came back with uh, bad amoeba. And um, it, for me, you know, fortunately, it wasn't nearly as severe as Manu's, but it took them almost six months before they figured out what was wrong with me. And, you know, Manu almost lost her life because they sent her home and told her to drink a bottle of water. Well, Forrest, it seems like you could have almost been on two shows in Discovery. They have monsters inside me. <laughs> got the amoeba kick in. If my sister's listening, which she might be, that will, that terrifies her as the amoebas. Yeah, but, they're um, bad. Yeah, I can see how that would be a problem in L.A. They're not prepared for dengue. Um, no. So, and and... By the way, is that even contagious? Like, were, no. they compared, were they worried about anything like that? Well, because they didn't know what they were dealing with at first, they did have me in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not contagious. It's a bloodborne pathogen oh, okay. only transferred by mosquitoes. Okay. Only by mosquitoes. Only by an infected mosquito. The one creature I would love to rid the planet of, even though they say... You know, you could kill bat populations and birds and things like that. But don't you both think that the world could do without mosquitoes? Yes. I hate mosquitoes. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to be a, a, a hard question for you guys. <laughs> or uh, flies. It's, 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 it's so uh, hard to watch everybody on Naked and Afraid as the bugs just devour them. I remember watching Laura Zara just getting devoured by those, like, sand flies or whatever those were on the beach. And it was just, I don't know if I could, you know mentally handle something like that my entire body being covered you know well, you got to worry about you know um you know kind of anaphylactic shock with that amount of bites and all that don't you oh a absolutely but the thing is this is this is what i do to prepare because i knew about the sand flies they call them teachers and the other biting things um i i just completely detoxed 
from everything. And, and I kept my foods very bland, very basic, and I didn't wash my body. I didn't wash my hair for a couple of weeks beforehand to completely rid of my body of any sweet odors or anything that would attract insects or, you know, uh, biting insects. Interesting. And in, in the swamp area, believe it or not, Russell was getting his ass bit crazy. And yet I wasn't getting as affected as he was. So I think that does make a big difference. But I mean, you look at someone who drinks a lot of soda or alcohol or, you know what I mean, their diet is not good or healthy. You know, that stuff, your body is going to excrete, excrete that kind of odor, which is going to attract insect bites. So bugs love reprocessed junk food for a human. <laughs> Just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Well, you know, I'm glad you're feeling better. It's, you know, your last physical therapy session in September. I mean, that's not long ago. We're talking in mid October right now. Podcast won't probably won't be released for a few weeks, but I mean, that's a long time to have to deal with something like that. How did it affect your, your livelihood? Like, how did you live? I mean, you mentioned that you're married, so you had somebody to support you, but if, if you were a single person, I mean, that, that could have been extra bad, don't you think? I'm going to tell you right now, if I was a single person, um, uh, and if it wasn't for William, and, and Forrest has met William, so, you know, he knows what kind of man he is, I would be up Shit's Creek. I yeah. would be living in my car. There is, would be nothing that I could do about it because I could not collect unemployment. I could not collect any form of uh, state disability. I had no subsequent income. For my own survival, living here. The, the, the producers on this show were they informed of your situation, and had anybody reached out to you to see how you were doing, or was it more like lawyers were saying, "Don't touch this issue"? Uh, no, I did have a visit from the producers. Oh, that's nice. In in hospital, yes. Very cool. Well, that's good to hear. Did yeah, you... it was good. They came a couple of times. They were really concerned about me too. Yeah, it probably would be bad publicity if somebody died from uh, <laughs> working on the show. Yeah, that probably would end that real quick. It would either give them a lot of publicity or it would knock that show right out. So, sure, that probably was a concern not. of theirs. Well, this is a concern of theirs then, and it's going to be a continued concern. Yeah, it's no joke out there. You can you can see what people are going through. I'm surprised that nobody has had. And, you know, um, well, you, you were close to death, but it, it seems like it's it's bound to happen that something serious is going to happen to somebody. You know, it's, I mean, and my news certainly come the closest. But, uh, you know, as they continue to push the envelope and I don't mean this in a negative light, um, but as they continue to push the envelope, I certainly believe that the the chance of infection and the risks increase. But, you know, at the same time, um it's just a stroke of bad luck what happened to Manu. I mean, you know, we were in Panama, and, yeah, we were out in the middle of nowhere, but, you know, less than 30 miles away were whole villages of people that hadn't contracted the same disease. And, you know, it, people live in these locations. It's not like we're putting ourselves into into situations that humans certainly cannot come out of. Right. Um, and, I, I, you know, it, it of course, they're more, more well adapted to it and things of that nature, but... You see, um, you see people like Manu and myself and other, other naked and afraid participants that are very comfortable and used to this, you know, sterile Western way of life go out there and contract things that locals either would brush off and laugh at or, uh, not contract it in the first place. Well, they certainly handle it in a different way. They have their own, I mean, remember the village that we were at, um, you know, certainly that was, that's a pretty obvious area for the dengue uh, to exist there. Any sub subtropical, if there's humans there, there's going to be dengue. Um, it, you have you read about the uh, dengue fever outbreak in China? Thousands, uh-huh. thousands upon thousands of people are dying. So, what is the? How do you? How do you solve that problem? Is it just has to be a, a massive 
effort to cut down on insect population or like where do you even start if you have like a large population with a pandemic like that where do you start let me let me answer let me face that question with another one do you um i mean as a biologist i feel like you know i don't feel like it's common knowledge where we've overpopulated the planet with humans and you know as you can take this as hippie or as right wing as you want to go with it, but <laughs> at what time, you know, at what at what point do you say that's just enough humans? And I'm not saying that at any point in time people will stop trying to develop remedies and medications, but I feel the the planet has to fight back in some regard. Well, it's interesting. It seems like we're in a, a tug of war right now with the planet, at, with the population, as you mentioned. It seems like um, on one side, if we do not produce more humans and exponentially grow the economy, it's destined to fail on a global scale. On the other hand, mm. Mother Nature is sick and tired of us, you know, moving around and populating so much on the planet. It seems like that there's only going to be a natural right that is corrected. Um, right. Knocking people out, whether you're talking about a pandemic, whether you're talking about a natural disaster, there is a population level that I think probably the planet is meant to have. And from what I can see, just as a layman, is it's vastly overpopulated. Certainly. Um, no, we've well surpassed what the Earth can sustain as far as human populations. And people don't see that because there's a lag. But if you look at the fact that in the last 100 years, humans have wiped out 50% of the animal species on this planet and animals you know, make up our food source, and that, you know, never mind water or oxygen and the trees we cut down and the water we consume. But, you know, right. it, there's no doubt in my mind that that we are overpopulated. And, and, you know, things, again, you can get as hippie or right wing as you like with this, but things have a way of leveling themselves off. Right. And I, I feel agree. like it's only a matter of time. I, I agree. agree. I uh, agree, too. I've always been into these post-apocalyptic uh, films and books, things like that, because I have, like, this... I don't know. It just seems like something's not right. And um, I don't think that <laughs> a zombie apocalypse or, <laughs> you know, some kind of massive disease that wipes out half the population is positive. But I do think that people do need to be aware, like you're talking about, um, that, you know, it's really I don't think people, especially in the United States, give a thought to how overpopulated we are, how fast we're using resources like if if, sure. if everybody in the world lived like somebody in the United States, we'd have been fucked many, many, many years ago. <laughs> in the in the in the 90s, um, uh, what was the statistic? I believe it was pre 90s. I, I'm going to quote something and then get called out on it. But at some point in time, there was a statistic that read that um, the U.S. made up eight percent of the world's population and consumed eighty percent of its resources. I don't doubt it for one Whoa. second. Whoa. I don't doubt it for one second. And I'm just as guilty as any other American. You know, I have a, I live in suburbia. I have two cars. You know, I've got the house, sure. the mortgage, two kids, the dog, you know, the whole works. So I'm just as, just as guilty of it. And a lot of times I kind of, I have to reevaluate what I'm doing with my life. Is, is this something that is positive for the world? Is something that it's negative for the world? Um, we're all kind of in our own type of bubble environment. Like what I see around me, I'm living a normal lifestyle. If I sure. look at somebody who's in Zimbabwe, I, <laughs> I see that it's I, it's vastly different. You know, sure. And well, you know, it's a matter of the social norm. You caught you don't want to be right. the weird guy that lives under the bridge trying to eat squirrels to save the planet. You know, yeah. and I'm not quite neither, there, neither do but... I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that. I'm not quite there, but I do think that uh, at least I have more of a conscious um, mind behind of a lot of the things that I'm doing. I think a lot of people that I talk to with some of the ideas that I discussed in the podcast previously, people don't even really think about it. It's it's something no. that they're just kind of on autopilot and, well, I eat the meat because it's packaged from the grocery store. They don't understand, right. like, this is a packaged dead animal that came from somewhere that was butchered somewhere and was raised on God knows what. People don't really. Sure. No. I find that there's a lot of people that just really don't care or just don't want to put the effort behind to caring. It's well, very aware, awareness blindness. is key. Awareness is key, and there's no doubt that the U.S. Uh, is probably one of the front runners in awareness for things. And you know, we see it a lot out here in California, Jason. You know, there's, oh, yeah, there's yeah. this farm to table move. 
movement and all organic and all fresh and whole whole markets popping up with food that only comes from 30 miles away or less and things like that. So at least out here in California, I can say that, you know, awareness is growing. And I believe I do believe on a on a less doomsday type of note that that is that is a positive thing that we're seeing. Do you guys think it may be too late? It's always too little, too late. Doesn't matter who you ask, when you ask it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's also you know people just got to be more conscious of of their everyday lives and how they go about their everyday activities. You're right; they're all on autopilot because they're used to the convenience of everything being provided for you. And right God away. knows if something happens, what do they do? They pick up a phone phone and and dial the first you know first uh number for assistance their people have lost the ability to self sustain themselves to take care of themselves even to for example shave and change a tire right and i mean and, even even more basic level than that it seems like yes we have all these technological marvels we have automobiles we have the internet we have all these machines that are doing work for us, but let's say the power goes out and doesn't come back on. How many people legitimately have the skills to be able to survive, even in an urban environment, urban survival? Exactly. A very, very minute handful. Yeah, I don't, th- I don't see, and I've even, t- when I talk to people and my friends about this, and even some relatives are like, well, all that goes down, I want to be one of the first ones to die. I do not want to be left, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a fucking mess. And I see where they're coming with that, but that's not me. I would want to give it a shot. I would hope that I would have some kind of ideas to be able to get myself and my family through some kind of a disaster. There's different levels of that, of course. Um, but I do, I do think that the power goes out. You are going to see stuff go down like The Walking Dead. Not the zombie part of it, but, you know, the, the bands of, um, you know, marauders that will take advantage of other groups. And I just see, like, everything falling apart in society. You know, the well, I mean, you out. see that societal collapse just when there's a natural disaster that doesn't really do any exactly. substantial damage. Yeah. So imagine exactly. if there was a real disaster. <laughs> We've already seen it right here right. in the United States. We've already seen it. We've already experienced it. And the thing is, is that people here, or people even around the world, tend to forget way too easily yeah, we way climb too back easily. into our and, creature comforts quite easily don't we right right and um you know the other thing is you know you to talk about electricity what about water <laughs> but, yeah, that's a big problem look at our situation all over the world our water sources has become critical what's going to happen yeah i think a lot of michiganders over here by me we we largely take fresh water for granted. I mean, we yeah. have all we have most all of the world's fresh water right in our backyard. Mm-hmm. Um but we don't I mean, I've moved around a little bit. I've I've traveled the United States and done different parts of different work in different parts of the country. I, we settled in Colorado for a couple of years and there's major water problems there. I mean, yes. the whole Colorado River is uh is a problem. You know, that People, people keep moving out west. You look at states like Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, California. All these states are water deprived. Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, you know, all these places are, you know, they have severe drought problems. They have water right issues. Um, you know, it's, it's not like in Michigan where you dig a hole, you can find water and that's your water. It's not like that out west. You have different, you know, land mineral rights and things like that to deal with. Yep. Um, so as the aquifers are being depleted, you know, what happens when the majority of the country runs out of the water and people in Michigan here, we're kind of already preparing for that. Like, well, we know that everybody's got their eyes on the Great Lakes, you know, different countries have their eyes on the Great Lakes just because of all the fresh water that's there. Interesting. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting. Maybe Michigan will be the, the wealthiest state in the land when everybody <laughs> runs out of water. Well, there's all kinds of theories associated with that, as I'm sure you know. I mean, mm-hmm. one being that, you know, our, our, uh, global climate's about to change, get hotter. And obviously when it gets hotter, our fresh water gets, you know, recycled to salt water. And 
things of that nature. But out here in Southern California, where Manu and I are, I mean, I live in a in a very affluent area in a beautiful beautiful house, house. and um, And, um, all of my neighbors who have much nicer and are are more affluent, and and myself included, are um, on severe water rationings to the point that um, in my city, if you go over three months in a row, they'll come and put restrictors on you, and that's how bad it's getting. Yeah. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're Oprah or who you are, there's nothing you can do about it. There's just not enough water this year. No, there isn't. I talked with a uh, guy I work with down in the Dallas area, and all last year he was talking to me about the weather and the lack of rain and all that. But they've gotten some, some water since then, but, you know, they were getting desperate. They were, you know, filtering their sewer water bringing it back into their tap drinking water. I don't think they'd ever done that before, but I definitely yeah. think we're going to see more and more of this, especially in the western states as time goes yeah. on. Yeah. Well, Santa that- Barbara, where I live, is commissioned um, in the, the mid-'80s. They had a desalination plant, a big, big multi-million dollar desalination plant, and it was decommissioned because in the process of building it, we had several good years of rain. And they never completed it. And, you know, in that time, desalination, the technologies come at tremendous distance. And now we really don't have any water. So I think we're going to see a big shift in desalination as well Isn't for the a, states that border the ocean. I've heard that that is a high energy uh, usage type of way to, to do that. I mean, is it, uh, I mean, I, at this point, you know, you guys are having an energy crisis at the same point in Southern California. So. <laughs> I wonder how you guys would uh, how you guys would manage all that. It seems like you guys got a lot of problems over there. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, it, it, you're 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 absolutely accurate. It's incredibly high energy to produce fresh water from salt and desalination. Although the technology has come leaps and bounds, they haven't got it to the point where it's very sustainable yet. Hence the reason we don't see it much. Um, and uh, but you know something that I think we're going to see a shift in, and we are starting to see a shift in it, is more sustainable and renewable sources of energy, harnessing wave power. You know, we already do wind and solar, and, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's so many ways to harness energy, and we've, you know, we as people, and especially in the first world, have been so lazy about harvesting it, mm-hmm. and um, I feel that, you know, with necessity, we're going to see a big shift in that. And it's also going to be a fight with the corporations as well. Oh, that's an understatement of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and and that's that's why it has become like it is, is because uh, this um, sanctuary, if sanctuary, if you want to call it, uh, th- this is the time and reason for corporations. Interesting. I've uh, you know speaking of energy and corporations, I've and uh, later this week I'll have somebody on the podcast, a fracking activist. Uh, mm. He actually lives in Colorado, um, but I, I know it's big in Colorado. It's big in Michigan right now. It's big in yeah. a lot of states with the shale deposits. Um, sure. But, I mean, when you're getting that desperate to, to go on in and clearly there are environmental effects that aren't being talked about on the on the mainstream, at least, um, it seems that, uh, you know, there's a lot that we could do as far as pushing solar or pushing wind. Um, I actually worked uh, in the solar industry for a little while, and I was amazed at what the technology could do, how little maintenance there is. You set it and forget it. You know, you just collect. You just, you know, the sun is, uh, <laughs> all you need is the sun. Right. Um, and I've, I've even seen some studies where if you take um, the energy needs of the world in the amount of solar panels to get that done, it doesn't really take that much. I mean, it would take up, you know, uh, maybe uh, you know the panhandle of Texas, I guess, could power the, basically the entire globe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may be way off there. Like I'm, you know, again, I'm just a layman here, people. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there's a much better job that we could be doing instead of, you know, it seems like the corporations they take these short-term profits and run with it, but the devastation to the environment will be paying for thousands of generations. It's, you know, the the, sure. stuff, the Gulf of Mexico with you know the the Deepwater Horizon oil rig, you know, that whole mess. It's like, oh, we'll just spray some chemicals on the top, let it float to the bottom. Sink it, yeah. (laughs) Uh, The environmental disastrous effects of that are going to be shown for years and years and years to come. That's right. It's uh, We need to stop subsidizing profits and 
you know, put safety and people's health first and foremost, in my opinion. I mean, I'm, again, just a layman here, but it seems to only make sense. No, I mean, I don't think you're going to find anybody that argues that with you. And, you know, necessity is the driving force behind evolution. And we'll come to a point where these things are necessary. We're out of coal or we're out of water, et cetera. And we'll, we will have to find ways to continue. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get off the, uh, let's get on to something a little bit more positive and, and lightning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Manu, I, uh, I took the liberty of researching you a little bit and, I see some interesting things that popped up in some of your bios that I saw. Um, one of them was uh, special operations training. Were you in the military? Oh, I was in the military, but the special operations training was just um, a company that I worked with that was um, oriented towards leadership training, communication training, um, and, and what sorts for corporations, believe it or not. Okay. And the reason why it was called special operations training was because it was headed up by retired Navy SEAL and, uh, was also affiliated with the cadre, which I was one, um, Navy SEALs. So that, that's really, that's all that is. It, it wasn't, it was just a contract job that, um, when, we had these events going on. They would call me, and I would be part of the team. Cool. And then uh, you also do something with kids, right, with uh, camping trips or hikes. What, what's that all yeah. about for 6th, 7th graders? Um, well, uh, since uh, July, I started out with a, a company here in Los Angeles called ARC, Arc experience and basically it is an after school program or, you know, day adventures program for the schools. Um, kids from, you know, year, f uh, year six, year six, I think is the youngest. And, and then we also work with college students as well. And these are all programs that develop to give them all an outdoors experience, camping, hiking, backpacking. Um, rappelling, rock climbing, kayaking, you name it. It's, it's a pretty awesome job <laughs> to, to, to have. It doesn't pay much, but you know, when you're being paid to do something so, so positive and so fulfilling and you just see these kids and even the college kids just, just feel so much more empowered and more confident within themselves. Um, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be heading up to the San Giorgio, um Mountains to climb the summit uh, with 6th and 7th graders, and I'll be gone for four days to do that. That's awesome. You know, there's no shortage of iPods and iPads and computers around for kids and video games nowadays, and I think it's super important that kids get out and just see what's out there a little bit. I, I just don't think a lot of kids understand, you know, what nature really is all about. And when my kids tell their friends they're going camping and they want them to come, it's like, there's a, like a look of horror on their face, like camping, like how, how could I survive, you know, if I don't <laughs> have my electricity for a day? It, it's, I think it's great that you're taking kids out there and showing them the wilderness, um, I'm a huge uh, mountain lover. When I was out in Colorado, I did a lot of mountain climbing out there. I try and get back there every so often to continue that. Um, but, you know, if there's something about when you get out in nature, call me a tree hugger or whatnot, there's something magic that happens. Oh, uh, It seems yes. like you kind of reset yourself, and uh, a lot of the stress goes away, obviously. When, oh, when, yes. When you eliminate yourself from that. <laughs> that American type of lifestyle just for me, but yeah, uh, I can never get enough get of it. To, you get to shed a lot of negativity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, it, it's, um, you know, the, I, the, the kids love me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love, <laughs> I just love being around the kids there. It just excites me. I, I mean, I've already got gooey feelings, you know, just thinking of the past things that I've done with them because it's, you know, you see them like brighten up and, you know, you see them go through difficult challenges and I'm just there just to 
you know, actors like, it'll be okay. You can do this. Mm -hmm. You can make it, you know. You're a mentor is what you are. Yeah, absolutely. And you're teaching them something new. You're having them experience something new. And once they experience it, and once they've achieved something, then it, you know what, what it does, it sets them for their next obstacle or their next challenge. Because they can look back and go, oh, well, I, I did that. So, you know, perhaps I can do this. And so with every challenge that they face or hardship that they face, it's just going to get a little more easier. Yeah, but then it's going to lead to one thing and another, and then they end up with uh, dengue fever. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a risk we all take, right? I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with a broken leg right now just because, you know, I like to train jujitsu. So, ah. I mean, it's, there's there's sometimes there's going to be injuries that happen, but that's the price you pay for going out and doing stuff that is above and beyond what somebody would be considered normal. I like to get out well, of that comfort that's zone. True. So. That's true. With every, well, well, with any adventure, or even just getting into your car, driving across country or going to another city, there's a risk. You know, blow out tire, you know, you can cause an accident, and it, it's just a fact of life. But if you survive it, guess what? You've got something to gain knowledge and experience. You, you've gained that knowledge and experience, and it just prepares you for the next. Right. Speaking of surviving an experience, Forrest, what yes, are sir. you doing jumping into the water with a hammerhead? <laughs> you caught that video, <laughs> did you? I did. I was pretty shocked. I'm like, Oh, cool. He's doing some spearfishing. There's a hammerhead circling the bow. I'm going to get to see the hammerhead fan or something like that. And <laughs> nope. Nope. You just jump in the fucking water. No big deal. Well, <laughs> you know, that's me in a nutshell. Um, I, <laughs> I wish I had a rational explanation for why I did such stupid things, but I don't. <laughs> now we well, just do it. Yeah. Don't we? No, that's, that's something that is, uh, well, my greatest fear is a great white shark since I was a child and saw Jaws. That is just like, it, it's just uh, one of those things in my mind that I, I just can't get over. So the one thing that's on my bucket list to do is get in a shark tank before I die. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be have to, how I have to approach a shark. There's no way I'm uh, just free diving with a, a 22-foot hammerhead with just a spear gun. It's not gonna, not <laughs> well, it's not a, not everybody's cup of tea, but I sure enjoy it. And, and, you know, even though I've had some narrow misses, and that one wasn't that narrow, but it was a little closer than comfort, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, you know, I still still go back and still keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I've done my uh, fair share of scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and uh, used to come across quite a few sharks. But I never ever felt, never ever felt concerned or, or, you know, you just keep your eye on them. The only shark that I always used to be very wary of and concerned about if I just see the one is the bull shark. Mm -hmm. Um, the bull shark, I think you've got to be more, uh, worried about than the, the great white, <laughs> in my, in my opinion. We had a pretty, uh, you know, talking off of uh, predators here, not quite a shark, but you had a pretty horrible experience when you were a kid with a crocodile, didn't you? Yeah. What was that like? But but that that was, I mean, where we grew up, I, I mean, it was all very well known that we had a lot of saltwater crocs in the Salties. mangroves. Yeah, in the mangroves along the river. And it's funny because uh, about five years ago now, I think it was, um, I went back home. And my brother and I jumped in the boat and we're cruising down the river. And I, I, I was just amazed. I could not believe how huge the saltwater crocodile population ha has gotten to, even since when I was a kid. I mean, now salties, yeah, they were in the river, they were in the, in the uh, mangroves and, you know, things like that. We were always wary of them, particularly the females when they're nesting. Um, you know, that's, the, that, that, that's a major concern and things like that. But, um, yep, they're everywhere on the farm. <laughs> I got enough of them when I saw Crocodile Dundee 1 and 2. <laughs> 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 uh, I would love to uh, hit Australia and see the 
the uh, wildlife you have down there. I'd love to see the kangaroos and the crocodiles, the whole deal. It's just like a completely different world down there, it seems to me. Yeah, it is. It is. It's beautiful. But that's with every country you go sure. to. There's always going to be their unique beauty, uh, uh, you know, of, of nature in everywhere you go. Right. How often do you get home? Um, well, I wish I could say that I go home often. But in the 16 years that I've been in the United States, I've only managed to be able to go home once. Wow. Yeah. That's too bad. Oh, so, well. Yeah, we move on, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> so what do you guys have on the horizon? Any uh, interesting adventures coming up for the both of you? Uh, well, I'm up in San Francisco right now, and I leave for Florida on uh, Sunday uh, for a dive trip, and we will be diving with a lot of bull sharks um, Careful. and Careful. Uh, doing some spear fishing and having fun over there, meeting up with some of my uh, with my dive team and some of my sponsors. And um, just having a good time. Oh, oh very that's a cool. Good plan. <laughs> yeah. And me, I'm just uh, continuing on taking the, you know, these. I'm about to head up to the San Bernardino Mountain Ranges to go and do the summit climb with the kids. And um, I mean, basically, you know, I'm just living simple, basic, day by day, and uh, keeping as positive as I can. And, uh, just live life normally. That's great. And, both, uh, just making more people aware. Just sharing, sharing uh, uh, awareness, uh, conservation of of nature, the wilderness, animals. You know, I do volunteer at a wildlife sanctuary uh, just north of Los Angeles, and so, you know, that way I'm educated. You know about the wilderness and exotic animals and so on. And that way I can share all that information. Every, everything that I'm doing now, I believe, is a purpose for me to share and and teach others more awareness and being more conscious of their daily living. Very admirable. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I'm really excited that you both could be on the show. Um, Manu, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you if they want to get a hold of you? Um, my favorite social media that I've, I just mainly use is Twitter. And, uh, I guess if you look up survive Manu, um, or at Michelle Manu, I think it is M E S H E L L M A N U. Okay. And Forrest, uh, what do you got going on? Yeah, I mean, I've always got something going on. And for anybody that wants to follow along, I mean, like you said, there's that great recent video of me uh, baiting in the hammerheads and swimming in and trying not to get bitten by him, even though he tried. <laughs> and we've got some alligator videos coming up from Florida next month, as well as a whole bunch more dive videos and, you know, good photos and fun stuff because I'm always on the go. Uh, and my spot is Facebook. Don't have a web page or anything, but that's Forrest Galante. Uh, you can find my public page on Facebook, like, follow along. I'm always happy to answer questions, messages, etc. I'll be sure in the episode notes, uh, you guys are listening out there, if you want to connect, there's going to be some uh, some links right on the main post for this podcast. You can go there and you can follow along with both Manu and Forrest. A couple excellent adventures and uh, really enjoyed the conversation, guys. Um, you have anything else, anything to add? Well, uh, thanks a lot for having me, Jason. It's great to chat with you, Manu. I'll let Manu take over. She had something to say, but yeah, just thanks. Thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Pleasure here. I was just going to say is uh, uh, I'm very fortunate that, and, and I'm very grateful that um, I met Forrest. Um, I believe you know, and Forrest, you know, see if you. Uh, Agree with me on this one. You don't have to be a, an actual survivalist as such to survive. You just got to be willing to learn and keep your options open and, and be creative. And, um, I, I just want to really, again, thank you, Forrest, for er all the hard work you did out there because you <laughs> were the one that was going in the damn water every damn day. <laughs> a know. thousand percent. Manu, I, I would never pick anybody over doing it with you again. It was uh, it was a pleasure 
it was and is a pleasure to meet you and to be your friend. And I mean, I've said that before when we're not on a radio show and you know that, and uh, I'll see you in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, sweetheart. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. All right, everybody. Get out there and get out of your comfort zone. I'm not saying go dive with sharks. I'm not saying to go get dengue fever in, uh, in Panama. <laughs> But, definitely but don't rule anything different. out. Yeah, yeah, don't rule anything out. That's right. But, but get out there and, <laughs> and do true. something a little bit different. It helps you grow as a person, and uh, yes. it never fails to disappoint. You, you can even learn from bad experiences, obviously. So, that's true. Uh, that's true. You know, I, I know Forrest has been through bad experiences. I've been through, you know, very bad experiences, and you learn from it. Mm -hmm. it seems like the, the worst ones you learn the most from. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes you stronger. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate it for us. Appreciate it, Manu. Hang loose out there, everyone. Thank you. Well, everyone, thanks so much for listening. But uh, don't go anywhere just yet. Got a couple extra things coming up here. Um, the music you're listening to right now is brought to you by Secrets. <laughs> Check out the website, intellectualgentlemansclub.com. Hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Rate us on iTunes, Stitcher. Give love to our new sponsor, Renault Video Productions. And check out our affiliate links for Amazon, Audible, and Onnit.com at intellectualgentlemensclub.com backslash support. Now you may hear Wisdom of the Elders from Robert Anton Wilson this time. After that, Black Mill is going to fade us out with Sarajevo. Everything that gets into your brain affects your reality tunnel, your worldview, or your belief system, which I abbreviate BS. The, the, two, the, the, the three major things I've been trying to teach in all of my books is never believe fully in anybody else's BS. I don't care if it's Roger Nish, the Pope, L. Ron Hubbard, George Bush, or I don't care who it is. Don't, don't, don't swallow all their belief system totally. Don't, don't accept all of their bullshit. They're all their BS. The second rule is like unto the first. Don't believe totally in your own BS. Which means that, as Bucky Fuller said, the universe consists of non-simultaneously apprehended events. And what you think it is, unfortunately, the universe is non-simultaneously apprehended. What? non-simultaneously. The universe is non-simultaneously apprehended. What? The universe consists of non-simultaneously apprehended events, which means any belief system or reality tunnel you've got right now is going to have to be revised and updated as you continue to apprehend new events later in time, not simultaneously. You can't apprehend, you can't comprehend, you can't perceive, you can't understand the whole universe at once. That requires some thought and some repetition. The universe is non-simultaneously apprehended. But we go through our lives minute by minute, second by second day by day we're never perceiving the same universe that we perceive because if we are it's because we stop paying attention that's why you get bored you're not paying attention we can't apprehend the whole universe right now the past present and future and all, all space time how it takes nine years for singles to get here from Sirius even think how long it would take to get here from the other end of the, from the furthest galaxy so, you know, in terms of general relativity, it's not the same time everywhere, so the universe is not simultaneously apprehended. But that means our knowledge at any particular time is knowledge of part of the universe. Tomorrow we'll know more. Maybe not much more, maybe a lot more, who knows? I might turn on CNN tomorrow morning and find the greatest scientific discovery of the last five million years has just been announced. Now, who knows? And then again, it may take 20 years for them to break through that magnitude, but scenario universe is not simultaneously apprehended, which is why we need maybe logic. Our maps of the universe, our ideas should be changing all the time. So people will claim I've got the truth. Just don't realize. They think they comprehend the whole universe simultaneously. It can't be done. All they comprehended is part of it. They haven't comprehended everything up to date either because most of them don't know everything that happens up to date. I don't know everything that happens up until this date. And the people who are most sure of themselves know even less than I do in most cases, which, is, which means they're really dumb. <laughs> 
This is the natural functioning of the human brain. It's the way children's brains perform before they're wrecked by the school system. It's the way the minds of all great scientists and artists work. But once you have a belief system, everything that comes in either gets ignored if it doesn't fit the belief system or it gets distorted enough so that it can fit into the belief system. You gotta be continually revising your map of the world or you'll lose more and more contact with reality. Anybody who has a belief system which covers the whole universe, that would be the Roman Catholics, Orthodox Islam, the Scientologists, Psychop, the Marxists, the Objectivists, and most of the assholes you meet on the street. Uh, well, what, they, what has happened is their brain has stopped receiving new signals. But well, to the extent that new signals do get in, they all have to be edited to fit into the belief system.
I never said I was a gentleman, motherfuckers. Actually, 